Hi everyone, welcome to Code Curly. My name is Sandeep and in this video we will go over how do we design a navigation application like Google Maps. Now let's go over some functional and non-functional requirements that we want this platform to support. So the very first thing is when a person wants to move from point A to point B, this platform should be able to give them a couple of information. Firstly, what is the route that they should follow? Uh, now, given that route, how much distance they'll have to cover and how much time it will take. As an enhanced variant, we could also build a system in which we show them two, three routes and then let them choose whether they want to minimize the distance or minimize the time. The next thing is that it should have a very pluggable model. So let's say we make a very basic design which just has no traffic data or anything of that sort. Now let's say if you want to plug in traffic information, it should be easy enough to add it. Now post that, let's say if you want to add information about weather or accidents or construction going on somewhere or road blockages, something of that sort, it should have a very easy way to input this data and not make a change in whole of the architecture. So that's the main idea of making it pluggable. There's one more thing that we'll cover in a very uh, brief thing uh, that is basically how do you identify roads. So there are two, three ways in which I, we can identify new roads. So one very basic or the most efficient way is to just ask government sources to give us all the information about all the roads data that they have. Now they might not have all the data, but at least we'll have a good starting point. Uh, now beyond that, we can ha capture a lot of organic data. So let's say if a lot of users are going on to a place or a route kind of a thing, which we don't identify as a road, then we can easily say that it, there is a road that we don't know of and we can kind of onboard that road onto our system. Now we can use some data like number of people traveling on it, uh, which sites are they traveling to, what is the volume of traffic, what is the speed and correlate that with the existing roads that we have and try to even come up with how wide the road is. Is it a single lane road or if it's a four lane, six lane kind of a road, all of those information could be figured out. But we'll still not go into this in much depth over the video. Mainly what we'll focus is how do we efficiently find the route between two points. Now coming to the non-functional requirements, the very first thing is this system should be always available, right? This should not go down. The next thing is it should have a good enough accuracy. Now let's say if you are not giving the very best route, but if even if you are giving a good enough route, that should be okay unless it's not a terrible route, okay? And it should not be too slow. So let's say if it takes one second, two seconds, three seconds to do all the calculations and come up with the output, that should be okay. It's not that it should respond back in a millisecond with the best route between two points. That's a bit too much to ask for. A uh, couple of seconds, one, two, three seconds should be okay. But it should not be too slow. Like it should not take 15 seconds to come back with the response. Okay. Now coming to the scale, again, I do not know if these numbers are authentic, but uh, from what I've heard and read, uh, Google Maps roughly has a billion monthly active users. And these users generally access Google Maps a couple of times in a day, uh, or maybe a couple of times in a week at least. Okay, what that means is we'll probably have roughly five to 10 billion uh, requests coming in a month for um, time, distance, and route between two points. Then there are also five million companies which uh, use Google Maps. So companies could be companies like Uber who are using uh, Google Maps to come up with the navigation and pricing system or it could be smaller companies which have a very similar use case. But that being said, we need to keep these things in mind that we have a very large volume of users who are coming into system who will be using this platform and design it accordingly. Now, building this navigation app is a very hard problem to solve. Not because of the kind of algorithms that we'll use, but more because of the kind of requirements this has. So for example, um, if we try to calculate the number of roads in the world, there are various theories which you know come up with various numbers. In general, people kind of claim that there are somewhere close to 50 to 100 million roads in the world. Uh, it could be you know even a much larger number. Now, if we try to model it as a graph, it would probably have somewhere close to 50 million uh, vertexes and maybe you know hundreds of millions of edges if we divide the roads into multiple chunks and all of that, right? So that is a very very massive data set. Now. A lot of companies don't even have access to this kind of a data, wherein what road is connecting from where to where. That kind of information is kind of non-existent throughout the whole world, and there is no single place where you can fetch that, which makes it a very hard problem to build a navigation system like this. The next thing is, uh, it is very, uh, it is very hard to even quantify a lot of attributes that you know impact the ETA. For example, traffic. 
and weather condition and road quality things like these are very hard to quantify so there is not a very easy mathematical formula that you can come up with to calculate the eta that will be required to cover a particular distance uh, one more challenge with this is a lot of things into the whole uh, road systems are very unpredictable there could be an a random accident happening somewhere there could be a road closure due to any kind of reason and those things are not really predictable and that's the main reason why you know a lot of companies have not been able to build this kind of a system successfully we'll be using an ideology of dynamic programming uh, while we try to solve this problem so basically what we'll do is we'll try it for a well, very small area and then we'll try to solve it for a larger area and then even larger area and then across cities and countries and so on and so forth so before we get started let me introduce you a concept called segment now this is not an industry standard term i just uh, made up this name on my own so just keep that in mind a segment is basically a small area uh, that is uh, small enough that we can easily operate on to it uh, think of it like we can have segments of um, 1 km by 1 km um, throughout the globe so let's just say if we have a city uh, something like this what we'll do is we'll divide the city into multiple segments now ideally there will be a lot more segments than what we are drawing but for understanding this should be good enough okay now the idea behind these segments is that uh, it will have four coordinates which are the four corners of a segment through which we can identify the segment boundary and each segment would have an identifier you can say this is segment s1 this is s2 something of that sort now the thing with segments is uh, whether a point lies within a particular segment is something we should be easily uh, be able to calculate so for example uh, think of it like a coordinate system you have these x axis and y axis this is your point 0 comma 0 this is your point 0 comma 1 this is your point 1 comma 0 and let's say this is your point 1 comma 1 okay this is your uh, square of one each right now whether a point lies within this or outside this we can easily identify based on what its coordinates are right and similarly for this based on its x y coordinates we should be able to identify whether this lies in this particular segment or not so what we'll try to do is each user will try to map it to some segments basis their coordinates right now one good thing about these segments is because these are functions of lat long um, we would easily be able to identify some approximate distance between two segments so let's just say if you want to identify this distance between this this segment and this segment right so basically let's say if we come up with the center points of both of these uh, and these are two lat long we can easily find the distance between aerial distance between these two points we'll use this um, in the later sections but it's a very easy mathematical calculation given two lat long find the aerial distance between these right now what we'll actually do is uh, let's say uh, the whole globe for example right we'll actually divide the whole globe into multiple segments some of the segments would just have water and nothing else but most of the segments would have some localities and we will be solving for one segment each and then we will extend the solution for multiple segment, segments which will then cut across multiple cities and countries and what not okay now the way we will model the road network is like a graph okay so think of two points let's say this is point A and this is point B and then there is a road between these two points okay so this becomes one vertex this becomes another vertex and the road between them can be represented as an edge okay now each road would have a weight now we'll not have one weight like you normally have in usual graph we'll have multiple weights so let's say this road is of length two kilometers so one of the weights on this road would be two let's say if we could have a bit more weights along with that we could have a traffic weight we could have a time based weight so let's just say we come up with the average number thing in general it takes um, 150 seconds to cross this road so 150 becomes another weight okay so this is how we we'll represent uh, a particular road and similarly there could be other weights that we can add okay now a road even though it looks like a non directional thing but it is actually a directed relationship okay normally how would you represent it you will say that there is one road from a to b which is 2 kilometers 
long takes 150 seconds there also another road which is from b to a which is again 2 kilometers long, uh, long but this one probably takes 200 seconds to cover right why do we need a directed relationship here firstly in order to handle if there is a different eta or different traffic pattern or something of that sort but more importantly if this says that it takes infinite amount of time to reach here that's basically a way to say that it's a one-way road only you can go from point a to point b but not from b to a right so we can use all of these uh, ways to track various things like one ways or various different kinds of roads right now even though if it's a directed graph but for all the like talking within this video i'll draw a single line thinking of it as a non-directed relationship because it makes the drawing easier and explanation easier but when you are actually going to implement it you will implement it as a directed relationship now let's look at what happens when you want to find the distance between two points within a segment or even et or something of that sort so let's say this is a graph of all the roads within a particular segment and there are these a b c d are the junctions or the points where you might want to start or end from and or everything else is basically an edge uh, and edges could have weights assuming all the edges have certain weights let's say this edge has a weight of first attribute is the length which could mean two kilometers the next attribute might say that how much time it takes to cover that uh, two kilometers right this would have a length of five kilometers and would take 700 seconds to cover that okay now let's say if you want to go from point a to point c how can we go right one there could be multiple routes so one of the routes could be from a to b to c there could be another route from a to b to e to c uh, there could be another route from a to i to h to g to b to c and there could be another a lot more number of routes right how do you find the best route from going from point a to point c now this is a very standard problem in the graph data structures there are various algorithms to solve it we can use anything like a dijkstra or a bellman ford algorithm to come up with the uh, shortest path between point a to point c right uh, once we have calculated this uh, we might as well decide to cache it right because it within a segment it's good to know how can you move from point a to point b normally what you would do is you would run something like a floyd warshall algorithm which calculates the shortest path between all possible uh, edges in all possible vertices within a particular segment and then store that information so that you don't have to recalculate it right so what it will end up being is there is there are these all normal roads which are edges and then there could be a calculated edge also which says that a to c the shortest path takes 10 kilometers it takes 2000 seconds and it is via point a then b then e then c something of that sort could be a calculated edge as an output of Floyd virtual algorithm which can be stored um, in uh, another data store which can then be looked up if you want to quickly look at how much time does it take from reaching a point a to point c now what we looked at earlier was given a junction a and given a junction c how do we calculate the shortest distance between those two junctions what if the point that what we are looking at is not really a junction which is a meeting point of two roads but any random point in the globe which just comes on a particular road let's say that point is x okay and now we want to find the shortest distance between x and c okay what that translates is basically find this distance let's say you call it i find this distance let's say you call it j basically find the two short two or three closest junctions from that point normally if that is on a road it will just be two junctions right and find the shortest distance from those two junctions so whatever is the distance from a to c and b to c uh, add i and j respectively into that and then whichever is the shortest one that becomes your answer now if you want to extend it further and say that i want to find a, the distance between x and y what you basically mean to solve is a to c the distance between a to c the distance between b to e and then these two respective distances added so this is let's say i dash this is let's say j dash so what you want to do a comparison is between i plus i dash plus distance between a to c or the, the distance of j plus distance of j dash plus distance between b to e 
right so this is how you can handle any point even if it is not a junction okay now whenever you are uh, calculating uh, remember we looked at uh, that we can use a floyd watch algorithm and then calculate all the possible distances uh, within a segment right uh, what we should also do at that time is look at what all possible exits are there from a segment why that's important we'll come to so let's say there are these two roads which are exiting a particular segment right let's say this is exit one let's say this is exit two right and the segment id is let's say s1 so what we'll say this particular junction is s1 e1 and this particular junction is s1 e2 what we'll also calculate is is distance of each junction not from just other junctions but also from these two points okay so we'll also know that what is the shortest route from reach from c to s1 e1 and from c to s1 e2 and we'll store this also as a cast information now let's come to how do we solve it across particular segments now let's say if you have this point a uh, from now on we'll just look at junctions because that makes the calculation easier okay you want to calculate distance from point a to point b and all these rectangles that you see are unique segments and this th these two points are in different segments then how do you actually calculate the distance between the two points and the same logic would be used to calculate the eta and anything else between these two points okay so what we are essentially saying is we have this point a and we have this point b now given the lat long we would be able to identify an aerial distance between them let's just say that the aerial distance between them is 10 kilometers okay we also know that each segment is 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer in length and width right so what we can say is we'll at max go so because this is 10 kilometers on aerial distance what we can say is adding some buffer we will not cross more than 20 segments on each direction either going from north to south or going from east to west that 20 number is basically a buffer that you can come up with based on your conversation with your interviewer okay but the idea is this number will give us some input on to how many segments do i want to look at so 20 segments on the north south side and 20 segments on east west side is we'll look at to come up with the optimal route from point a to point b because normally what would happen is there will be millions of roads into the world right and if we start doing a dijkstra across the whole globe just to calculate the distance between these two points that will be very unoptimal so we have to break that dijkstra at some point in time so this number would be used to break the dijkstra saying we'll not go further beyond this point okay now one obvious way to solve this is you have all the roads connecting the whole city which cuts these two points as well run a dice across the city and then come up with the shortest distance between point a to point b but if you look at it and if you look at it that way that there are probably millions of users squaring at the same time to find distance between any two points running those many number of dice algorithms would be heavily inefficient right so we'll do some slight optimization there what we'll do is there are we'll basically say that there are two exits out of this block basically to reach this block we need to exit this block and there are just two ways let's say we have calculated that these two are the only exits within this segment let's say this is segment s1 okay so a belongs to s1 and these two are the exits this is s1 e1 and this is s1 e2 right and they have some weight w1 and w2 let's say now what we'll do is this segment this junction is basically having two points one is s1 e1 two identifiers basically s1 e1 and s2 e1 this is segment id s2 and this is exit number one of that segment so this has another identifier for s2 what we are saying then is this has another point on the same route which is s2 e1 weight between them is zero okay similarly there will be a lot this graph is fan out now on the other side for b let's say b belongs to segment s4 there are another two exits through which you can reach b one is s4 e2 and one is this one which is s4 e1 right now if we just connect all the exits to exits for 10 blocks on the north side 10 blocks on the south side 10 blocks on this side and 10 blocks on that side we'll basically be able to come up with a crisscross of a lot of roads 
which connects these four points right and there'll be on a lot of junctions within that there'll be a lot of roads but these will be basically just entry points and exit points of the segment we don't really care what are what is happening within the segment when we are cutting across segments by because to reach this segment we anyway need to cross all of the other segments right now we don't care if this route which we are calling as let's say this is segment s6 and this point is s6 e1 this point is x6 e2 right now this is basically a calculated path from these two exit points this exit point to that exit point basically this real path could look something like this right but we don't really care what's happening within the segment all we care is from this point to this point i know a distance and i'll use that then from this point to this point i know the distance i'll use that so we'll basically be using all the exit points distances and use them as weights and come up with this graph at runtime okay now given like 10 points 10 segments on each side we'll probably have this graph of a couple of hundreds of um, edges at max right now we can run a dijkstra on this graph saying that what is the shortest path to go from here to here right this dijkstra runs on top of the graph which was created by just entry points and exit points in everything else and entry point and start point and entry point and end point in the starting and ending ending segment okay everything else was just a connector from individual end point to individual basically exits of a particular segment now this is fine when we have to travel for like 10 odd kilometers we can still create a graph of these 100 200 edges and calculate what if you want to go intra intercity what if you want want to go from city 1 to city 2 and then you want to calculate it then it becomes a big trouble to because let's say the distance between those two cities is 1000 kilometers then there are possibly th thousands of segments multiple thousands of segments that you look at right uh, that would be too complicated to run a dice at runtime now like we extended the solution from one segment to multiple segment we can basically create a mega segment right we can say that this whole thing that you see here is one mega segment and there could be this exit to this mega segment this exit to this mega segment and probably an exit here to this mega segment right and then what we can say is let's say you have this whole map of a country right i know it looks terrible but let's say this is one country what you can say is this is one mega segment you can basically divide this country into mega segments right and then recursively solve for it even further now when you were to if you are to solve in the mega segment world you have basically converted this whole country into possibly 50 mega segments and now if you want to go from here to here you basically need to just connect the exit points of individual mega segments right you don't really care what is happening within a mega segment you don't really care what is happening within segments under those mega segments and roads under those segments all you care about is from my start point how do i get to the nearest exit or all the exits of that mega segment and from these exits of mega segments how do I get to further mega segments recursively and then f somehow reach this endpoint? Right now, you can have n levels of nesting. Ideally, three levels of nesting is more than enough. Now, what is the ideal size of this mega segment? Again, there is no right answer. You can come up with based on some calculation with your interviewer again on this. Now, but the idea is if you still want to calculate this thing across cities or across states, this segment approach would still not scale. You need to do an abstraction on top of segments which can be represented as a mega segment and then solve it recursively okay all good so far but we have not really talked about how do we come up with the weights on an edge and how do what all weights do we even consider okay so the very first obvious weight is the amount of distance between two points right so that is one thing that we'll definitely have along with that we'll also keep an eta that normally under normal traffic conditions in the normal weather conditions how much time does it take for a user to go from point a to point b okay now when we have both these information we can obviously keep a next obvious thing saying what is the average speed 
of vehicles right speed is equal to distance upon time so basis that we will be able to come up with an average speed now you might think that the next obvious few things are weights like traffic and weather condition and all of that but i would definitely not recommend that given that this is let's assume this is what we have built already and now somebody comes up and asks you to implement traffic data into this okay now if you want to add traffic as a weight onto your edges that will be a very very bad design right because with an additional attribute that you are adding you are basically changing the logic of your underlying dijkstra which runs on a segment right now let's say tomorrow somebody comes up asking you for a weather information you will again change the whole logic of your dijkstra that piece is a bad design okay so ideal um, basically the set of things that a good design should entail is basically that it should not restrict addition of new features plus each change should be small enough and contained it should not basically impact the whole feature so what we'll say is traffic and all all of those in things are basically attributes which impact your speed okay and basis whatever your average speed is you can calculate the et as a function of distance and average speed right so all we'll say is traffic weather roadblocks all of those they'll never be weights on your graph okay they would just be attributes that impact your average speed so average speed could be a function of traffic it could be a function of weather it could be a function of any number of fields that you want to let's say if you want to add a accident or construction work going on some place or whatever you want to add okay so all of those would basically impact your average speed now normally you don't have to do all these fancy things never ever uh, why because for a company like google maps they know uh, let's say there are hundreds of people going from point a to point b they anyway know how much time they took right plus a very important feature about this kind of data is this traffic data would always be normally distributed so if you want to plot let's say this is basically any metric let's say eta of how much time it took uh, for people to go from point a to point b on a graph it would always look like a normal distribution okay what that means is you do not that there is this point which most of the users are hitting and as a with some statistical calculations of one standard deviation from each of these points you will be easily able to calculate this range that normally for most of your users at least 50 60 70 percent of your users this is the window of time that it will take let's say this is five seconds this is seven seconds and let's say average is six seconds for example okay so statistically you can come up with this number as a function of lot of users who are crossing the roads so you don't really care how much is the traffic what is the weather when you anyway have this real time information okay so for all the geography where you have people using your application there you have organic data from real users at this point in time so you don't really care about traffic and all of that traffic and all other things will come into picture only in places where you can either not get enough data from users or there is some other reason why you are maybe legally not allowed to get information of users right because of which if you don't have real data of users then is when you will bother about using traffic and weather and all those attributes to come up with this average speed number based is that you can even know the distance from point a to point b you can come up with the eta okay now how do we quantify traffic you cannot say that if there are 805 vehicles it will take this much amount of time right number of vehicles on a road and things like that cannot be calculated at all no matter how good technology you build right so when these things cannot be quantified how do you use them as a measure okay so what we can say is we'll create, create multiple tiers uh, let's say this is traffic measurement and this is weather management you all you can say is traffic is low or it is medium or it is high and weather is good or it is bad right so you'll have these kind of ts for each of the attributes that you have and all you can say is every time traffic goes from here to here it has a 20% increase on to average speed or something of that sort right every time traffic goes from low to medium average speed reduces by 20% basis these transitions of traffic volume now you can always say that traffic is low or high based on the number of users that are probably using your application or from some other sources right let's say if you have this kind of a measure 
so there are companies like ways and all which will give you these kind of information that how is the weather how is the traffic in a very abstracted form okay now once you have this information you can calculate average speed as a relative number from the original value calculated so let's say with a good weather with the medium traffic you knew the average speed was let's say 20 kilometers per hour now if the traffic goes to high you kind of reduce it by 20% so it basically becomes 16 kilometers per hour based on this kind of a calculation you will calculate the eta now uh, as and when inputs are coming you are making changes into your weights on the graph how does it impact the overall system so coming back to the previous drawing that we made remember we had something called as a segment and we had lots of roads within the segment and let's say there is a traffic increase we got a signal from some third party saying traffic has increased on a particular road now do whatever you want to now let's say there was this one exit point and one exit point and distance between this was some let's say there was some x weight to this particular um, theoretically calculated road right and let's say it was actually using this particular road on which the traffic is increased let's say this actually was following this kind of a graph something of that sort okay now similarly all other roads are getting changed so all you can say is remember in the all the theoretically calculated roads that we actually calculated we were casting that what all real roads are a part of this theoretically calculated road which is the which is not a real road but a calculated edge okay so each time this thing changes weight changes on any real road you basically try to infer what all actual cached roads are impacted okay and then you basically make a change into the cached roads also so you say that okay the time taken initially was 10 seconds for this part now it has become 15 so let me increase the value of this particular calculated road from point e1 to e2 by 5 seconds okay now let's say you do this for one segment then what basically happens is you recursively bubble it up over across a lot of cache things so let's say if there was a mega segment who's who had this kind of an entry exit point let's say this is me1 and this was an me2 and you know that me1 the route from me1 to me2 uses this e1 e2 so what you will do is you will basically bubble up the amount of time for this route by 5 seconds so what you are essentially saying is as and when you get traffic data you basically update the eta on a particular road then update the eta on all the calculated roads that this road is a part of and then update and then basically that becomes at a segment level and then do the same thing recursively for all the segments that are a part of mega segment so basically what you are doing is you are bubbling up all the calculated values and then updating whole of the graph okay now these things are not happening at once not all the signals are coming up at once right so as and when something changes you bubble up till the level where it goes and then stop so let's say this road was not a part of this me1 me2 for example then it will stop at the segment level right but if it is a part of a mega segment road also then it will bubble up till the mega segment level now other than just traffic and weather there is also one very important factor that you can use so you can also use historical eta to come up with a real or a predicted eta for a particular road right and this historical eta is basically calculated uh, in a way that you basically look at the day of week and the hour of day so let's say monday 5 pm um, this road takes 20 seconds to cover but on sunday 5 pm it this road takes just 10 seconds to cover so something of that sort is what you can uh, cash at a um, level of a day of week and a hour of day and then use that historical data to infer so let's say if you do not have traffic information also then you can use this kind of an information to somehow come up with the predicted eta now coming back to the segment to to some activities within the segment so let's just say there are a lot of roads on the segment there is, there are these two exit points and there are these points which have some roads now let's say we have calculated that the eta fastest way to go from point se1 to se2 involves 500 units of time 
let's say 500 seconds okay and it uses the route se1 to a to b to c to se2 okay now let's just say that there's a traffic increase on a to b now we could identify it via a lot of attributes let's just say people moving between a to b their average time increases right or we get a signal saying you know the traffic has increased significantly for whatever reason let's say we increase the time of basically the eta of going from point a to point b so it would impact the eta from se1 to se2 right now there is a limit to which it can bubble up right so let's say it increases from 500 to let's say 550 due to some increase in a to b so all that is okay but let's just say that um, we have real data of users and for some reason it is taking a lot of time for from people for people to go from point a to point b and let's just say this increases to let's say 850 now a jump from 500 units of time to 850 units of time is a very big jump yeah, it is having a like roughly a 70 percent increase right so now it is possible that the fastest route from sc1 to sc2 does not include this route abc it could be some other route so what we'll do is if eta increases or decreases generally in case of increase only we'll do this if in eta increases by greater than some percentage right this is a configurable amount let's just say we have it said that if the eta increases by 30 percent then we'll recalculate things within that segment right because all the updates that you are getting are against a segment only okay so whenever a particular uh, road time increases you can calculate everything within the, that segment right which means recalculating the path from se1 and se2 now let's just say that we figure out that now the new shortest path is not this path and it is basically the path from se1 to a to h to g to f to e and to se2 right so this basically becomes your new shortest path right now if it is the shortest path then we need to bubble up that information right first of all we need to say that whoever was traveling from sc1 to sc2 now needs to follow a new path right which is the path from se1 to a to h to g to f to e to se2 right this is one part of the things but what if there was a mega segment over here right which encompasses a lot of segments whose exit points were also including this particular path right this is let's say me1 this is let's say me2 now if the exit point path for, of this mega segment also includes this path then even that mega segment's path would change so the part where they use abc now that would con get converted into this right so these are the things that you will have to do uh, each time a weight changes so when the increase is beyond the threshold then you have to do so let's just say increase happened from 500 to 510 then all of this calculation is probably not even worth it because the best you can get is probably somewhere between 500 to 510 now let's say 10 seconds would not be too much of an enhancement right but if it is such a big jump from 500 to 850 for example then you might as well recalculate everything within the segment and then bubble up whatever is required now you'll not just calculate with respect to exit points you'll also calculate the shortest path to reach from let's say se1 to a or se1 to b right all of those will also be calculated but for representation this was a good enough way to explain you the concept now let's look at the architecture of the whole system so we'll do it in two parts first we'll look at the flow wherein all users are connected to the system wherein we are capturing their location information from all the users even if they are not using our map service this is basically for improving our map service altogether and a bit of user profiling in the next section we'll look at how does the actual navigation flow work for the user who want to find the shortest route between two points and what are the systems required for that and at the end we'll look at some of the analytics with that let's get started a bit of a convention to start with um, things in green are basically uh, user devices could be mostly these will be mobile phones could be web browsers as well um, things in black are load balancers plus reverse proxies plus the authentication authorization layer in between which will authenticate all the external requests coming into the system um, things in blue are the things that we have built on our own it could be web services capital consumers or anything of that sort 
Uh, things in red are either some infrastructure component that we've used or some databases or some clusters like Kafka, Hadoop and all of that. Cool. So let's look at how the user flow begins. The very first interaction with the user is when they have a their when they have the app installed on their phone with their location services turned on. So we get regular pings from a user device every few seconds. Now if the user is stationary the device will have the logic to not send the location ping every five seconds and maybe send it every five minutes or ten minutes or something of that sort because that will reduce the load on our system if the user is anywhere at the same point but while the user is in transit we will increase the frequency so as to make our data more accurate okay uh, this talks to uh, this basically um, keeps a persistent connection with the device. Um, the reason for a persistent connection is so that we don't have to create a new connection. Uh, also, this would be generally a WebSocket connection because sometimes we might need to send some information onto the user device as well. Okay, so this WebSocket handler is basically the service that talks to all the user devices. Now, there would normally be thousands of such uh, WebSocket handlers for talking to all the users that are currently online. Uh, so we'll need somebody who can manage the fact that which handler machine is talking to which user. So then comes something called as a WebSocket Manager. It basically keeps a track of which machine is connected to which uh, WebSocket handler. So which user device is basically connected, connected to which uh, machine of this WebSocket handler service. Okay, it basically keeps that information in a Redis. If let's say it Lost that information is lost. We can kind of pull that information again from the server So we don't need to kind of store that information in a persistent data store The next thing what happens is as and when users are sending their locations the frequency of the Location pings is handled by the device and then the device location comes to us Which is basically coming at the location service now location service is basically a repository of uh, all the location related information it basically has some endpoints through which you can ingest some user's information, something like a user ID with a timestamp with a particular lat long, that kind of a structure. Now it puts all of that information into a Cassandra as a permanent data source to keep a track of the fact that which user was at what location at what point in time. Remember, this is not just for um, users who are using our app right now for navigation, but for all the users in the world. Okay. How this data would help us will come to in a while. Now, as and when it's getting location pings, it is also putting all of those pings into a Kafka. Now, all the location pings that are going into this Kafka are basically read by this part streaming consumer. Okay, this does a lot of calculations. Some of them are here, and some of them we'll look at in the later sections. First of all, what it does is, if let's say a lot of users are traveling at a place where which we do not identify okay but their traffic their movement pattern tells that it looks like a road so this basically is a job which, which would be a streaming job which would look at last 10 minutes of data and see how the users are moving and basically it will be used to add new roads into our system okay now as and when a new road is added each time a new road is added that would basically impact the particular segment within which the road is added and then basis that all the segment related information that we calculated earlier that we talked about earlier that would be recalculated so that might impact a lot of segments and mega segments recursively if that's a very critical new road that we have found okay the next thing is basically an average speed job what that does is it basically looks at again if you look at within a segment a lot of people moving from point a to point b it tries to figure out what is the average speed that these users have over let's say last 15 20 minutes and use that information to as a proxy for a real-time information and then suggest that and basically it will then update the weights of the graph that we talked about earlier right again that would bubble up to various segments and mega segments if that's a part of the critical role now, how would that bubble up process happen? So this past streaming jobs, individual jobs, would actually write back things into Kafka. So let's say if a new road is identified, it would write back to a separate topic saying, I've identified a new road which connects point X to point Y. Now, there'll be a map update service which listens to that particular topic, and it updates it in a data store. It updates it in a graph Cassandra, which is managed by this graph, graph processing service. So 
each time a new road is found map update service would invoke graph processing service to tell that i found a new road just store that in your data store which sits on top of a cassandra now what the services we'll look at in the next session in more detail now each time average speed job finds out there is some change that has happened it would again put an event into kafka in a separate topic now and there will be something called as a traffic update service that, that listens to this topic which would update the traffic related information again into the same cassandra through graph processing service okay now there is something called as a hotspot identifier so let's just say there is a particular locality on which there is some average number of people per given area kind of a metric that we have now let's say suddenly a lot of people start gathering in that area it gives us a signal that there is some activity happening at that point it could be that there is some social event some sports thing happening or but something is happening there so that could be able to identify hotspots within the graph because eventually once we identify that hotspot we'll know that after probably a while there will be a lot of traffic in that area as well right so that could help us in certain ways now for certain things fast streaming would itself infer a lot of information and put out events but in general it will dump all of that data into a hadoop cluster which has location pings of all the users across a lot of time right now we could do some uh, ml jobs onto it which classify this certain other things so let's say if you have identify a new road but we do not know what kind of a road that is if it's a one way if it's a two way road if it's a single lane road or maybe a six lane road so all of those things could be identified by this road classifier and this particular job could now put that event into that road topic and map update service could now store that additional information saying that now that i have not just identified that road but now i also know that this is a probably a six lane road or something of that sort right now there could be something called as a vehicle identifier now while you are getting location ping if you start getting those pings at a very high frequency let's say every one second if you are getting that you can infer a lot of information about the vehicle in which the person is traveling so let's just say that uh, the traffic is going normal at certain pace but one particular person is stopping every few kilometers let's say okay now what that could mean that could mean that either there's a red light or there's a traffic jam there possibly right but we know what are the junctions we know where the red lights can be we know how are the traffic jams are because we know the data of other users as well now if it's not any of these two criteria then that means that the person is traveling in a public transport something like a bus and then the bus is stopping at each bus stop right other kind of things that we can infer is if let's say the right is bumpy or if the person is going left and right here and there very frequently or having a very fast acceleration and very fast braking it's probably a two wheeler if not in all other scenarios if it's a smooth enough ride stable enough acceleration going straight in one road it is very likely a four wheeler now we do tell information to google specifically that we are actually traveling in a two wheeler or four wheeler while we select a map but if let's say that option is not available then this kind of data would be good enough to infer which kind of vehicle a person is traveling in which will help us in a lot of other attributes so these individual jobs what all they identify they could put that into and back into the same kafka in probably a separate topic for each job and then those information could be analyzed even further now let's look at the user journey when they want to actually uh, get the navigation from point a to point b so normally what people do is they search for a particular location which then gets converted into a particular flat log right so all of those is being done by area search service this basically does two kind of things so one is it has some areas within a uh, elastic search on which it provides fuzzy searching and once the person has searched for a particular at area or locate locality or location anything it then gets converted into a lat long so basically it stores the lat long along with the place name description all of that in a document the other thing is it tries to dynamically figure out given address kind of a thing which lat long that address points to so it does that address resolution into a lat long as well okay now let's say so post the response from this user will have a start point and an end point as a latitude longitude both of them and then they would want to request the path 
okay first let's quickly go over what is this navigation tracking service so while the person has actually started the navigation and they are going towards the destination all of their location coordinates will be tracked as part of navigation service this does two main things first is if the user is deviating from the route that we suggested we'll kind of inform the app back and then that will probably show a pop up kind of a thing saying that you are probably going wrong maybe you want to course correct to the right path alternatively it will also store all the data so it will push all of the data into kafka while the person is traveling and that data could be used for later analytic thing at this point in time a person search for a route from point a to point b and this was the route that we recommended it could be used for figuring out uh, how good the uh, recommendation of the path is cool that being said let's jump to the main piece which actually figures out how to connect point a to point b okay so all of those requests are being handled by this map service this map service over here is basically an interface service which provides uh, multiple interfaces for people to request the directions from some point to some point one of the interfaces is given to the user devices a similar interface could be given out to companies wherein all the rate limiting and their throughput calculation against their account information is being calculated and stored okay this doesn't it's not a intelligent service it just forwards the request to some to something called as a graph processing service graph processing service basically does a lot of things first of all it queries segment service which sits on top of its own database of cassandra in which it stores all the segments and their corner coordinates along with a lot of information of those segments so let's say if the if the graph processing service wants to figure out that um, what are the segments for the start point and the end point it will get that information from the segment service now if it so happens that both the points are within the same segment then it's a short duration ride then the graph service might choose to do a couple of things it might look up that do i have this data already cached if yes it will directly return to the map service saying there is the response okay if not it will then decide what do i do next it can now if it is the same segment it can probably say that i'll run a proper dice trace algorithm and then try to figure out the shortest path between the two points it can do do that and then return the response alternatively if it's in different segments then it will try to fan out into the whole basically it will try to create the pick the subgraph of the main whole world graph that we want to look up as part of the dice chart and run it okay now for doing that it will look up on a lot of things first of all it will look up for all the roads within those segments the entry exit points of the segments uh, into its cassandra it will also have live traffic information uh, which would have updated the ets into the graph uh, again from the same cassandra now it would have also got some input from something called as a third party data manager now it doesn't query third party data manager at runtime third party data manager in fact pushes data into graph service uh, which then impacts the live traffic information so let's say if it says that there is a huge amount of traffic at certain point it will update that let's say if it says that there is a massive kind of a rain happening somewhere it will update the live traffic information saying there is a, a, some rain and that would probably cause some delays and the average speed would slow down and ets would increase something of that sort okay now using all of that information it basically creates the whole um, graph that we looked at in the previous sections and then it either looks up in the cache and returns the result or it might run the dice trial algorithm or some algorithm to basically figure out the shortest path between two points and then return the result now let's say if it doesn't have any traffic information any eta information it might also query historical data service to find out at this point in time how much eta can i expect from point a to point b if it doesn't have that information for some of the points now historical data service sits on top of its own cassandra which basically stores information of the form that at some day day of the week like sunday monday tuesday in some hour let's say 4 pm 5 pm something of that sort from point a to point b how much was the average speed of people normally and how much eta did it take so all of that kind of information would be stored in historical data service basis all of that graph processing service will return back the response to map service and then to the user going by the exact same set of logic that we looked at in the previous section
okay now all of this is done a lot of events have gone into kafka one of the common events was that by the area search service which we didn't go over so each time a search is happening the service will put an event into kafka now what that would do is it will basically give us a list of areas that are being searched more often so we can do some optimizations for them another thing that would happen is so now we can do a lot of analytics on top of this data okay that is coming into kafka one of the very first thing we need to do is to figure out that out of all the third parties that we are integrated with which of them is actually giving right information and which of them is actually giving a wrong information how do we do that so let's say some third party gave us some information saying so from point a to point b there's a lot of traffic and eta would increase but our data if it says that eta have not been impacted at all uh, that means that particular information was incorrect right now if that happens from the same third party a lot of times then we can safely say that that part, third party has a wrong information or it gives us wrong information right now this third party manager abstracts out on a lot of third party companies so we could be pulling data from a lot of companies all of that is extracted under this third party data manager but the reporting would be done at a individual organization level that being said um, there are a lot of other kinds of analytics that we might want to do first of all uh, we might want to identify what is the road that a particular person is on right uh, so as part of navigation you want to probably have a audio kind of a thing saying uh, turn right in 90 meters to get on mahatma gandhi road or something of that sort right all of that inferences could be done by the spark streaming saying where exactly i am in how much time am i about to reach a, re reach a junction and what is the road name on which i'll get to next so all of that could be done by this there are a lot of other analytics that we could also do on top of this data let's look at it next so out of all the events that are being put into this kafka there is a lot of analytics that we can do and we should do so one of the very important things to analyze is how accurate our eta predictions are so let's just say we predicted that it will take 40 minutes to cover a distance from point a to point b and if it takes something around 38 39 minutes then that's fairly accurate but if in real world it takes somewhere around 20 minutes then that's a fairly bad prediction so we need to have this data on how accurate our predictions are so that we can figure out that we need to invest more time into you know upgrading that algorithm that comes up with the eta along with that it will also give us some information about which of the routes are the ones that we are recommending to people but people are not taking maybe there is something wrong with the routes that uh, exist in our database right so all of those things could also be inferred uh, some common things that we can infer is what are some common hotspots in the city that people gather at these could be some social gathering places or things of that sort so that will kind of uh, give us some points of interest that we can build over time uh, using this data to start with uh, other than that some obvious things that we can also figure out is uh, what are the home locations and work locations of some of the people uh, we could also infer Uh, user profile data so for example if a person is going to a lot of pubs for example then they are more of a social kind of a person if a person is traveling out outside the city very frequently on weekends the person likes traveling so things like that can also be inferred based on just the location data coming to the last thing now this normally wouldn't be a part of a design interview but uh, there is something you should be aware of because this is an important thing that you know companies like google maps have to take care of so how do you handle disputed areas so while in google maps there is a clear cut boundary of states and countries and all of that but if there is a disputed region how does google map decide where to make the boundary of the country or the state right so a classic example of this would be um, a dispute between the countries of india pakistan and china in the state of jammu and kashmir so india claims that whole of the land is under their territory china claims that some of the parts of that state belong to china and pakistan claims that some of the parts of that state belongs to pakistan so now how does google decide or any such mapping provider decide that how where do they define the country boundaries right now this becomes very tricky for google because they cannot take anybody's side and whichever decision they make they are going to kind of piss off some of the countries plus that's even worse in this scenario because these three countries combined together have more than one third of the world's population so that's a very big source of revenue for google 
so how can you handle so what google does is something uh, very smart and also very tricky so what they do is based on the country where you are coming from they'll show you a different um, country boundary so for people who are coming from india to all of those people they show that the whole part belongs to india now to the people of pakistan they show that the part that they are claiming belongs to pakistan and the parts that china, are disputed between india and china are shown as a dotted line similarly for people coming from china they show the part that china claims is theirs they show under china china territory and the remaining disputed area between india and pakistan is shown as a dotted line with no country boundaries specified so this is something if it you come across this kind of a thing in an interview you could try to replicate uh, but keep this out of the scope of the interview at least but still something good to know so yeah i think this is it for a uh, google maps kind of a system thanks for watching this video if you have any suggestions on what videos we should make next or how we could improve this one do let us know by commenting here and don't forget to subscribe to this channel like the videos and share the videos with your friends while we keep working to get more such content to you Happy learning